Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Governor Dayton, for that warm introduction, your leadership, and this extraordinary opportunity to serve the people of this region. I'd also like to thank all of you for being here today. We are here to celebrate the accomplishments and partnerships that we have built together with the Metropolitan Council over the last 50 years. I'm sure many of you are fami familiar with the story of why the Council was created in 1967. Sewage was polluting our lakes and rivers, suburban development was gobbling up open space, and we had a booming population with no real roadmap for where infrastructure or development should be built. But the civic wisdom behind a regional approach didn't materialize from these problems alone. They came from an unlikely source, Major League Baseball. An article in the 1960s in Harper's Magazine detailed how both Minneapolis and St. Paul wanted to get a major baseball franchise. Each city put in its own bid, and because they competed against each other, both lost. To their chagrin, the author wrote, they realized that they could not get or support a big league team in baseball or football or hockey unless they operated it jointly as a Twin Cities venture. Thus, on the sports pages appeared the first sprouts of civic wisdom. The role, the, the role regionalism played in bringing the Twins to Minnesota is clear. In fact, the first Minnesota Twins logo included two baseball players, Minnie and Paul, reaching across the river, shaking hands. Today, our region is home not only to the Minnesota Twins, but many big league teams that contribute to our economy, our culture, our communities, and our quality of life. And now, in just a few short days, the Twin Cities will host one of the largest sporting events on the planet, the Super Bowl. Bringing tens of thousands of visitors to our region and putting the, the Twin Cities on an international stage. For years, partners across our region have worked together to both bid and plan for this event. And now we are going to show the world what true regional partnerships can deliver. And that's what I want to talk about today how the power of regional partnerships can propel us into a more prosperous future. In 1967, our state's leaders had a visionary idea to create a body with the express mission of guiding the region's growth. Ever since, the Met Council has used regional partnerships to tackle problems that were too big for any single city or county. Working together, we have built a prosperous region that businesses and families love. The Twin Cities has more Fortune 500 companies per capita than any other region. And we have 54 regional parks that attracted 48 million visits last year. If I had to guess, I would say me and my family are responsible for about 1,000 of those visits. Because if you live someplace as beautiful as this, you'd be wise to get out and enjoy it. We also have one of the best transit systems in the nation. In 2016, Metro Transit was named Transit System of the Year, and in 2017 was a record-breaking year. Just this week, Metro Transit staff finalized our 2017 ridership numbers, and I am excited to announce here today that our rail lines, the Blue Line, the Green Line, and North Star broke all-time ridership records. Ridership on both the Green Line and the Blue Line were up by 4%, and North Star was up by a whopping 11.6%. Altogether, these three transit lines provided 24.6 million rides last year, helping Minnesotans get to school, to work, and to home across our region. So I want to just say again, congratulations and thank you to all of our Metro Transit employees who play a role in providing a service that people across our region use in record numbers. So thank you again. When it comes to pursuing excellence, Metro Transit employees have a lot of company. Our employees in parks, community development, transportation, environmental services, planning, and housing are passionate, dedicated, and talented. And I am reminded of their role daily in, in, in building and providing for a vibrant region. Our region's prosperity and high quality of life have been recognized by USA Today, Time Magazine, and countless other online rankings. But our region is also known for being economically resilient. No one escaped the impacts of the Great Recession in 2019, but for the Twin Cities, our fall wasn't as far and our recovery outpaced most of the nation. We have a highly educated workforce, 
cultural venues, sports teams, beautiful parks, but one of the Met Council's greatest achievements comes with an unglamorous title, wastewater. In 1926, our region received some sobering news about clean water. That year, scientists did a survey of the Mississippi River south below St. Paul, and their survey found three fish. Not three species of fish, but three fish. For, for years, wastewater, had, wastewater pollution had poisoned our waters, and it was a wake-up call for our region. And in 1938, the Metro Wastewater Treatment Plant was built. As our region grew, more, more than 30 small municipal treatment plants were built across the region, but they quickly became outsized and outmoded and led to additional pollution of our waterways like Lake Minnetonka. In 1967, the legislature gave the new Metropolitan Council planning authority and oversight of that new sewer board with the goal of creating a regional wastewater system. And it's hard for me to say this part without smiling because it's so exciting. Today, we have eight regional treatment plants and 610 miles of interceptor pipes that connect 109 communities. The water we discharge is cleaner than the environment it is released into. Our water rates are 40% lower than our peer regions, and today fish and other aquatic life have made a significant comeback in the Mississippi River. Despite other environmental challenges in the river, we can rest assured that our wastewater treatment efforts are contributing to a cleaner and healthier river. Meanwhile, the Met Council is developing innovative ways to use treated wastewater for industry or even recharging our aquifers. Those are new ideas that are being explored in partnerships with communities across the region and will ultimately, hopefully, contribute to even better environmental outcomes for our, ri for our lakes, rivers, and groundwater. Last year, I saw the, the flip side to our innovative approach when I visited the city of Pittsburgh. 50 years ago, when Pittsburgh was a booming industrial town, they didn't take an, a regional approach to wastewater treatment, and the result is shocking. Today, over 9 billion gallons of untreated sewage is flowing into that region's three major rivers, and the region is under a federal mandate to clean up its waterways. Even if the Pittsburgh area can raise the $3.6 billion needed to do the job, fixing the problems will require agreements with 84 individual cities that all have separate wastewater treatment systems. There's no regional body in that Pittsburgh area to coordinate that effort, and it's interesting to see or consider what our own region might look like if not for the Met Council. Over the past 50 years, our region has made wise choices and invested in long-term solutions. And because of it, the Twin Cities metropolitan region is strong and vibrant and competitive in the global marketplace. But we face a serious risk, one of complacency. In 1967, the Metropolitan Council was a new and innovative idea, but today the needs of business and industry are changing, our population is growing and aging, and even our climate is changing. We may not be facing a burning crisis, but we are facing a slow burn that could set our region back, while our peer regions like Denver, Seattle, and Portland charge forward. We cannot allow this to happen. We need to meet our region's challenges head on. We need to partner together, listen to one another, and together address our region's three most pressing challenges. Safe and affordable housing, a modern and efficient transit system for a growing economy, and making our region a place where everyone has the opportunity they need to reach their full potential. A strong focus on these, three, on these key priorities will be essential to building a prosperous region, attracting the people, business, and workforce that we need to build a brighter future. Housing is a basic need, and one of the Met Council's most important jobs is to help communities plan for their long-term housing needs. And this is where I confess that I am not a native Minnesotan. Instead, I grew up in a nice suburban township in South Jersey where the quality of life is high and the schools are good. But sadly, my hometown is infamous for the creation of exclusionary housing policies. In the 1970s, the mayor of my hometown became known for saying, if you can't afford to live here, you'll have to leave. The sentiment was shared by many members of the community who were worried that creating affordable housing would destroy the public school system and send the community into decline. Mount Laurel didn't choose to be inclusive or to plan for a changing future. Community leaders had to be dragged kicking and screaming into the courts 
for, into a future that included everyone. Today, Mount Laurel has affordable housing and good schools, and even though Mount Laurel is a great community to live in, we will never know how much better it would have been had city leaders taken the energy they spent fighting affordable housing and expended it on building an even better community for everyone. Simply put, people should be able to choose where they live no matter their income. Stable, affordable housing is critical for people to be able to work productively, for their children to learn, and for families and communities to thrive. But right now, the need for affordable housing is outpacing the supply. Over 10 years ago, we told cities in our region that we would need 52,000 units of affordable housing just to keep up with household growth. But we've only created less than a quarter of that need. And it's not just a question of affordable housing. Vacancy rates in all types of housing are very low, lower than even our uh, other booming cities like Seattle, Denver, and Portland. So people who can afford to buy homes find themselves in bidding wars, and this causes home prices to go up. Meanwhile, rental rates are skyrocketing as well. Everyone is affected by rising prices, growing families, aging people looking to downsize, young workers who want to relocate here, businesses trying to recruit talent. Since 2000, the number of households spending more than half of their incomes to pay for housing has gone up by 77%. The more money Minnesotans spend on their housing, the less money they have for food, for transportation, for health care, and other, and other critical expenses. And this is unsustainable. Mike Webb, the mayor of Carver, really gets that. He owns a coffee shop, and on a recent visit, he said, it just seems reasonable to me that people who work in my coffee shop should also be able to live in this community as well. He fought hard for affordable housing on the western end of town, but unlike the mayor of my hometown, Mayor Webb understands that a vibrant community with a strong economy includes people from all walks of life. And that's the beauty of this region, we want to make it possible for all families to thrive here. It's why so many people want to live here. So we can't be complacent about this affordable housing shortage. Since 1996, the council has been part of the solution, providing more than 300 million in livable communities grants that have helped create or preserved 21,000 units of affordable housing. And this is really great progress, but this is not a problem that the council can address on its own. Fortunately, we have leaders like you, across our region who see affordable housing as a top policy issue and are just as committed as we are to finding solutions for it. One of those leaders, Governor Mark Dayton, is here today. I want to thank the governor for his leadership and for creating the new task force on affordable on housing that will tackle many of our region's housing challenges head on. We at the Met Council look forward to supporting that effort in any way we can. Having quality affordable housing is only part of the equation for a stronger and more prosperous region. We also need a modern, efficient transit system to support a growing economy. Transit in our region provides almost 100 million rides a year, and the vast majority of those people are either going to work or to school. So it's no surprise then when I hear that every business, almost every business organization tells me that transit is necessary to continue building a strong and economic, economically competitive region. They are competing to attract younger, highly skilled workers, and their future success depends on it. Market research also shows us that this group of people not only prefers transit, but is more likely to relocate to a region with a high quality transit system. The fact is, is we have hit a point of diminishing returns when it comes to expanding our freeways and roadway network. But transit gives us more bang for our buck. Just look at the A-Line, which went into service last year on Snelling Avenue and Ford Parkway. This new rapid bus line with Wi-Fi on high-tech buses with heated shelters tracking arrival and departures in real time has increased transit ridership along that route by 33%. The need for innovation and investment in our transit system is growing. By 2040, our region will add another 700,000 people. That's the equivalent of almost the entire population of North Dakota moving here into our metro region. <laughs> 
With that increase in population, we expect to see demand for transit increase by 80%. But it's not only the new residents who are driving demand for transit. As our population ages, the need for metro mobility is also increasing. And the business community makes its case time and time again for the increased investment in transit, saying that is, it is essential for their success in attracting a competitive workforce. The Met Council has worked with partners on this issue, including city councilors and mayors, county commissioners, neighborhood groups, car drivers, transit users, to develop a comprehensive plan to build out our transit system to meet the needs of future growth in the region. Our analysis concluded that in addition to new light rail lines, our region needs 17 new rapid bus routes, 46 new local bus lines, and significant upgrades to 76 existing local bus routes just to meet the basic needs of that increased expected ridership that we, we plan to see. We have a plan to build out this system, but there's one catch. We don't have funding to implement the plan. While the demands of our system are growing, our funding is unreliable and stagnant at best. Legislators provided some one-time funding last year which helped patch a budget hole, but in 2020 and 2021, we are facing a funding shortfall for Metro Transit of over $100 million. That kind of deficit will not drive our region forward. It will throw our progress into reverse. To meet the needs of the future, the legislators of today need to act like their counterparts a half a century ago and commit to investing in innovation and growth, not just for the next two-year two state budget cycle, but for the next two to three decades. <laughs> Governor Dayton's bonding proposals makes an essential $50 million investment in our region's transit network, specifically to bus rapid transit, like those that I just described on the A-line. Bus rapid transit, or BRT as it's called, is a proven solution to enhancing transit service along our busiest bus corridors. This funding could support the development and construction of many new BRT lines, including the D-line that runs from Brooklyn Center through Minneapolis down south towards Richfield. All told, the investment would connect hundreds of thousands of people with jobs across the region. These are the types of investments that we need to make to build a more prosperous region. It's no wonder that cities like Seattle, Denver, and Houston are investing heavily in all modes of transit because it's stimulating their economies. And we're going to lose our competitive advantage unless we do the same. Housing and transit are critical infrastructure and they are essential to our ability to build a prosperous region. They're tangible to everyone and they are challenges that will require the council and our collective sustained attention in the coming decades. But the third area that I want to address is less tangible. It brings together all of the work of the council, whether it's housing, transportation, land use planning, or even creating and maintaining our regional park system. All the work that we do can be summed up in one word choice. Over the past 50 years, the Council's purpose has been to ensure that everyone in our region has the opportunity to live and work where they choose. Those choices create opportunities our people need to reach their full potential. Our business community constantly strives to retain the best young talent trained in our state's excellent education system and to attract bright new talent from around the globe. If we want to continue creating choices for people and businesses and attracting talent from around the globe, we need to address a huge problem, equity. I'm not telling you anything new when I say that the demographic makeup of the, of the talent base is changing. Today, 26% of the people of our region are people of color. By 2040, nearly 40% 40 of our residents will be people of color. But our region is not providing opportunity to everyone. Among our peer regions, the Twin Cities ranks worst when it comes to disparity between white people and people of color who own homes, who hold jobs, and who live above the poverty line. We're dead last. And this is unacceptable. As Minnesotans, we believe in building a fair and just society where every child has the chance to achieve their potential. But it, is, it isn't just the right thing to do. It's the smart thing to do in a global economy where companies like 3M, Medtronic, Target, and United Health are built with intellectual talent. We simply cannot afford to leave 40% of the pipe population out of the pipeline. 
If we are truly a place of opportunity for everyone, then people and business will choose to live here, invest here, and make their homes here. Site selectors don't make it a secret what types of things they need for a strong business climate. Apple announced last week that it will build a second major campus somewhere in the United States employing about 20,000 people. They're not publishing their list of location criteria or inviting applications, but we can make some pretty educated guesses about what they're looking for. A modern transit network, affordable housing, a high quality of life, an educated, diverse, and highly productive workforce. Those are the ingredients for a successful business environment. Our region has those things, and that's why we're, we have so many Fortune 500 company headquarters and growing businesses here. But we need to do even better, much better, in fact, if we hope to attract major employers and thousands of new jobs to the Twin Cities. But it's not just the new potential corporate campuses we're looking to gain. A strong regional approach is essential for creating a better business environment for the employers that are already here, for our homegrown businesses, and many of the hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans they employ. Our businesses, our communities, and our families deserve and expect that we will make choices in the years ahead to secure a more prosperous future for the Twin Cities. And we should expect nothing less from ourselves as leaders of this region. Now we must choose how we address the challenges of our future. 15 years from now, let's imagine a region where we are again leading the nation and our ability to come together as the greater Minneapolis-St. Paul region to address our shared challenges. A region where residents can find an affordable place to live. A region where we are investing in our shared mobility through transit across all modes, not just buses, but also trains. Let's imagine a region where we double down on our investment to protect and preserve our natural resources through our regional parks. And let's imagine that we continue to top the charts as the best place to call home and raise a family. But we don't have to rely on our imaginations alone. We can accomplish all of this and more if we make a conscious choice to invest in the entire region. No single city, county, business, or individual can make these choices on their own. The generation that created the council understood this, and they made a deliberate choice to play the long game. To continue innovating, someone needs to look at the region's long-term needs and build the partnerships to meet those challenges. State law gives that job to the council. It's an awesome responsibility with a labor and a labor of love. It's frustrating and rewarding work with dozens of partners and literally hundreds of points of view. But the investment is worth it because we are building a stronger region together. I'm proud and excited to be part of that work and I would ask each of you to join me as we embark together on the next 50 years of innovation. Thank you.